All right. Welcome, everybody, to um, the 2020 Alice Report training presented by CRI Work Ready. My name is Andrea Nwaram. I'm Natalia Ribeiro. And we'll be going through a few different things today. Um, we're, first, let's go over our agenda. So we're going to define what Alice means um, and what it represents for Connecticut. Then we're going to talk about our key report findings from the 2020 Alice Report. And then we're gonna provide some recommendations for CRI. And at the end, we'll open it up for some questions and answers. Um, and feel free to leave your questions in the chat and we'll discuss those at the end. So Alice refers to households who are, um, I'm sorry. So Alice refers to the growing number of households in, in our community that are employed or unable to afford the basic necessities. The 2020 um, Connecticut Alice Report was published by the United Way of Connecticut, and it outlines the 2018 economic requirements to afford basic necessities in Connecticut and how this impacts members of our community who are struggling to survive. According to this report, CRI service areas have the highest percentage of poverty in the state. In 2018, 38% of Connecticut's 1.3 million households still struggled to make ends meet. And while 11% of those households were living below the federal poverty level, another 27%, more than twice as many, were Alice households, which refers to asset limited, income constrained, employed. So there are a few key terms that we want to define for you guys. The first is Alice threshold, which refers to Alice households that earn too much to qualify as poor, but are still unable to make ends meet. So households that fall within the Alice threshold often do not qualify to receive state assistance because they make more than the federal poverty level. However, they're still unable to afford basic necessities. So the household survival budget is used to determine the Alice threshold for Connecticut families. The Household survival budget estimates the actual bare minimum cost of basic necessities, including housing, childcare, food, transportation, healthcare, and a basic smartphone plan um, for Connecticut. And this is also adjusted across the different counties and household types. So the number of Connecticut families within the Alice threshold is more than double those experiencing poverty, as you can see in this figure. So these are some of the key report findings um, throughout the report, uh, cost of living, worker vulnerability. And then um, we also uh, went onto the Alice website and found how COVID has impacted Alice workers throughout the Connecticut community. Um, and from 2007 to 2018, um, Alice households increased about 40% in Connecticut um, as a result of rising cost of living, but stagnant wages. Um, and the percent of Alice households throughout this time period rose from 20% to 27%, as opposed to the people who f fell in the federal poverty level. Um, that only increased from 8% to 11%. Um, and this is because Alice workers are particularly vulnerable to shifts in the economy and major life events due the, to the jobs they have and the lack of security within them. Um, and then the COVID-19 in Alice um, portion of the report findings um, shows how the pandemic affected Alice workers. So here um, we have some statistics on how cost of living has um, increased while wages have remained stagnant. Alice households um, are more vulnerable to those in poverty sometimes. Um, the federal poverty level is the minimal and uniform um, national estimate of cost of living which far underestimates the household number of households that can't afford to live and work in our modern economy. Um, so 38% of households in Connecticut do struggle to make ends meet. Um, this is due to the increase in cost of living without an increase in workers' wages. So in 2018, we could see that 52% of Connecticut workers were paid hourly and 45% of Connecticut's jobs paid less than $20 an hour, which isn't a realistic wage to keep um, a family or an individual afloat in um, our modern Connecticut economy, unfortunately. So these wages of less than $20 an hour aren't enough to provide for an individual or a family according to this uh, Alice household survival budget we discussed previously. 
Um, and the Alice report reflects how the rising costs of living with stagnant wages has negatively affected Connecticut individuals. Um, so as many of you know, um, I'm assuming everyone lives in the state, um, the actual cost of household basics in every county in Connecticut is well above the federal poverty level for um, all households and sizes. Um, so the, and the hourly wages within the state that um, are required to keep this help to support the household survival budget is 1445 an hour for a single adult and 4533 for one worker or 2267 for each of two workers for the family survival budget. Um, and to put these budgets in perspective, the median hourly wage for most common for the most common occupation in Connecticut, which is a cashier, is 11.49, and this was from uh, 2018 statistic, or um, 22,980 if they are working full time year round, um, which is not uh, enough to support any of the Alice budgets that we've discussed. So here are some um, statistics about the cost of living essentials between um, the years of 20, 2007 and 2018. Um, so the actual cost of household basics in every county in Connecticut is well above the federal poverty level for all household sizes and types. Um, for a single adult, the federal poverty level um, was 12,140 in 2018, but the average household survival budget in Connecticut is 28,000. Um, 908. And gaps are even larger for families of four. The federal poverty level for a four person family was 25,100 in 2018, while the household survival budget for a family with two adults, an infant, and a four year old was 90,660. Uh, so you could see that there's a very significant gap between what we see as a federal poverty level and what is actually necessary to keep a family afloat, um, the cost of that. So the higher costs of the family survival budget are driven by higher costs associated with things like childcare, housing, and taxes. And higher taxes costs, higher tax costs can largely be explained by the increase in all other budget items. As the cost of these items increase, the earnings needed to cover the expenses rise and higher earnings result in a larger tax bill. So public assistance programs are based on the federal poverty level and, but the federal poverty level is not enough for a household to cover even its minimal costs as shown by the comparison by the household survival budget. This means that assistance programs ser serve far fewer households that actually need assistance, even in a strong economy, which we've seen fluctuate within the past few years, but um, we've reached a good point, but that wasn't enough to cover, which Andre will talk about in the next slide. Yeah, so Alice households are more, more vulnerable during natural disasters and events such as the current pandemic, as they often live in communi communities with fewer resources. So financial instability leads to additional costs for Alice households. In 2017, only 64% of Connecticut households had set aside any money in the prior 12 months that could be used for unexpected expenses or emergencies such as illness or the loss of a job. Though this was well above the national average of 42%, it still left more than one third of Connecticut households without any financial cushion. So in 2018, a record low number of people were reported to be unemployed. However, that low unemployment concealed trends that expose Alice workers to greater risk. These trends include growth in the number of low wage jobs, minimal increases in wages, and more fluctuations in job hours, schedules, and benefits that make it harder to budget and plan. Um, before we continue, can I ask everyone to mute their mics? Thank you. So as this pyramid illustrates, the type of jobs Alice workers have are vital to keeping the Connecticut economy running smoothly, but they do not provide adequate wages to cover the basics, necessities for these Alice workers and their families. So Alice workers predominantly work in maintainer occupations, which include infrastructure jobs and nurturer jobs. So infrastructure jobs 
build and maintain the physical economy in fields such as construction, maintenance, manufacturing, agriculture, mining, transportation, as well as retail. And nurture jobs, they care for and educate the workforce in the health and education fields, as well as food service, arts, tourism, and hospitality. So many CRI clients currently work or only have experience in these maintainer occupation, occupations. Maintainer occupations are essential to Connecticut's economy, but have not benefited from Connecticut's recent economic gains in 2018. These workers are consistently underpaid. Maintenance pay less than twenty dollars an hour. Um, and on the other hand, in an occupation of the pyramid, your jobs pay more than twenty dollars an hour. Innovator patients include adapters and inventors who work in the field such as policy making, man managers, or in leadership positions. So having an occupation in a maintainer job comes with a lot of risk. Um, as you see here, um, this blue uh, area in the graph shows the risk for automation. Um, so due to the precarious nature of Alice Worker's job, it's reinforced by this relationship of low wages and high risk um, by automation, which is defined by a 50% chance, chance or greater of this being replaced by uh, technology within the next decade. So jobs that pay $20, $20 or less are more likely to, replace, to be replaced by technology compared to higher paying jobs. Um, and these maintainer jobs pay less than $20 an hour and 85% of these low paying jobs are at high risk for automation. By comparison, only 42% of the maintainer jobs that pay more than $20 an hour are at a higher risk, so about double. Um, there's also a difference um, associated with salary and risk of automation based on the type of maintainer job. So among, among infrastructure jobs that um, Andre spoke about before, 97% of these jobs pay less than 20 an hour, but are at risk of automation compared to 59% of those that pay more than $20 an hour. So among nurture jobs, the discrepancy is even greater. 68% of jobs that pay less than $20 an hour are at risk of automation compared to only 5% of those that pay more than $20 an hour. And education is also linked to this job risk. Um, when you're uh, nationally, the risk of your job, uh, the risk of you losing your job is associated with how many years of education you have. Uh, if you only have a high school diploma, there's a 55% more chance of you um, losing your job as compared to someone with a bachelor's degree. Um, and that statistics at 24%. And here we could see um, the growth in low wage jobs between the years of 2007 and 2018. Um, a record of 52% of Connecticut workers were paid by the hour as opposed to having a salary that comes with benefits, paid time off, um, insurance and the like. Um, and 45% of state jobs paid less than $20 an hour, which provides an annual salary of about 40 grand. Um, and this is about $50,000 less than the family household budget we've been discussing. So uh, in this blue line here, um, you could see that those are low wage jobs, um, which are defined as those paying less than the wage needed for two workers to afford the family household survival budget, um, which includes costs uh, for two adults, the infant and a four year old. So in 2007, this was less than um, 1493 an hour. And by 2018, this was less than 2267 an hour. So and the number of low wage jobs had increased by 34% um, during this time period of 2007 to 2018 and accounts for the largest number of jobs in Connecticut. The medium wage jobs, which is the light blue line, um, allows two workers to afford a family household survival budget. Um, and in 2007, these jobs paid between 1493 and 2985 an hour. And by 2018, these jobs had to be paying 2267 to 4533 an hour per worker. Um, so you could see the increase of just 10 years, how much these wages have doubled, has, has, 
have had to double in order to have people afford these necessities to live. Um, and the number of medium wage jobs has stayed fairly flat throughout the years and it actually decreased by 3%, making it even more difficult to, for an Alice worker to have access to a median wage job, even if they do have the skills. And high wage jobs, which is the gold line, um, is defined by those paying a wage that allows one worker and a family to afford their uh, family household survival budget. And this wage in 2017 was between $29.85 an hour or more. And in 2018, this wage increased to $45.33, um, reflecting an in the increase in cost of living expenses in Connecticut. And overall, the number of high wage jobs um, decreased by 46% between the years of 2007 and 2018. So um, national conversations about work should focus on economic importance. Always work is work, a focus on the work of the innovation sector with its high paying jobs and how these uh, workers keep our economy um, working and afloat and they uh, make things happen. But the function of our economy truly relies on the work of the maintainers, which are seen in these low wage jobs and sometimes in the medium wage jobs too. And here we have some information about the pandemic and how it affected Alice workers. And um, this green line focuses on leisure and hospitality. The red is retail and transportation. And then the blue is just our comparison for um, the professional and business services, which is the innovation sector. And at the peak of the pandemic um, around April 15th, when everything shut down and stimulus payments were coming out, um, we could see how the employment rate decreased in each of these sectors. So the, the one that Alice workers primarily make up, which is the leisure and hospitality, decreased around 60% during this time. And retail and transportation, 28, and then our comparison of professional and business services only decreased 16%. All, of course, impacted workers heavily, but um, it just goes to show that uh, these uh, industries that Alice workers make up were hit the hardest and they're the ones who are most vulnerable and at risk to begin with. And uh, it goes through October 26 and you could see that things balanced out again, but um, the debt and the, the loss that accrued throughout these months has set back Alice workers significantly during this time. And Alice workers, um, like I said, are more vulnerable or not risk for losing their jobs. Um, and these Alice workers that did stay employed or were not employed, there's two categories for um, COVID with Alice workers. Um, the essential employee, um, which kept our infrastructure running during this time, thankfully, um, and took care of, of COVID-19 patients. Um, but there was risks associated with this. There wasn't enough adequate PPE. Um, so the risk of them getting sick or bringing sickness home to their families really impacted their decision on whether or not they should keep their job. Um, and things like Heroes Pay um, still wasn't bringing enough financial stability during this time for Alice workers. So they didn't know if it was worthwhile for them to keep their job. And some employers even pushed back completely on Heroes Pay. Um, so that just complicated the decision for um, Alice workers. And then there was the non-essential employee, which we see in this leisure and hospitality, which um, during this economic slowdown, it severely reduced the employment. This um, was food service, leisure, hospitality, and tourism. Those were hit, hit hardest. And also Alice workers are um, more likely to work for a small business within the state, which offers lower wages and fewer benefits. And it was hit the hardest um, with the number of small businesses decreasing about 19% between the months of January and August. And Black and Hispanic Alice workers were also facing higher rates of unemployment than um, their white counterpart. Um, so this number doesn't reflect on that, but uh, the report that was seen for the COVID and Alice, um, that showed that uh, Black and Hispanics were hit significantly harder than, than their white counterparts. Um, and with less access to internet and computers, Alice workers have a more difficult time working from home or even finding a job that they can work from home. So that decreases their job opportunities um, in this new world that we're living in. Thank you. 
So now we will provide a few recommendations for CRI based on the data that we just reported. Um, so these, our recommendations are related to recruiting, expanding training, as well as expanding support. Um, they'll help address, help CRI address technological barriers that our clients face and improve access and availability of our services. So um, this figure describes the Connecticut population over 16. Um, although the majority of adults in Connecticut were working in 2018 and most households had at least one worker, only 20, um, only 25 percent of working age adults had the security of a full time job with with a salary. The rest were paid hourly or worked part time. So recruiting clients for open job opportunities should target adults out of the labor force for reasons other than unemployment. So school and health issues are the main reasons cited by many adults who are out of, who are not in the workforce. And the remainder, remainder of these people out of the workforce, um, the factors are including caregiving responsibilities as well as transportation access. So the Alice report suggests that for these potential workers, only slightly higher wages can draw them back. So CRI should use this data provided to strengthen our recruiting practices and reach more Connecticut residents that may need our services. Uh, Connecticut student population is another opportunity for recruitment. Students are a significant part of the Connecticut labor force. For college students in 2017, 41% of full-time students had a job, while 82% of part-time students had a job. So hosting events targeted to full-time and part-time college students will provide an opportunity to serve a significant portion of Connecticut's potential labor force. So here we could see um, some demographics about people who do make up um, the ALICE threshold. And although 38% of households um, in the state do fall below the ALICE threshold, you can see that um, when we segment this into different um, parts of the population and see that Black, Hispanics, people under the age of 25, and single moms are um, affected way more by um, these conditions than uh, your typical counterpart. Um, so understanding this could allow us to have a culturally responsive recruitment. And um, it's important to understand the candidates we have coming in. Um, and we have to recognize that uh, not all the candidates are in the same box, so they can't go, go through the same process when it comes to intake and recruitment and um, just putting them through training and, and the like. Um, so they all come in at different points in their lives. They have different skills and experiences from their past. Some ha could have gone to college. Some could have not even finished high school um, or had a job ever. So it's important to recognize that and understand that everybody is different and that people within these categories are affected more than, um, than someone else. And um, the Alice threshold and Connecticut uh, the, these households are um, below the Alice threshold and the majority of the households that make up this proportion uh, have demographics that already include um, barriers that make it hard to secure uh, employment. And here we could see some um, tactics on recruitment when it comes to library locations. Um, it's there's a statistical significance between Alice households and um, those people use libraries more than somebody who has a medium to high income. So uh, it's important to see that uh, access to libraries are especially important for Alice families because libraries provide information on social services, job opportunities, free internet and computer access and a range of free programs at community meetings and even printers for them. So recruiting should use public libraries to reach potential clients. Um, collab even collaborating with these local libraries could provide direct access to potential clients. And now that more libraries have been opening after the COVID-19 pandemic, we can um, create events there and try and target um, these communities that need us the most. So we could create socially distant sign-up events that could be held at libraries. Um, libraries could also just share a CRI flyer on their website um, and uh, that could uh, advertise their social media page and our website so that people could just walk in and see 
oh, hey, like this is a uh, career resources I've ever heard of them. Let me let me um, find a res another resource to find a job. Um, also, by knowing library locations that are highly used by the community, this could direct direct us um, to implement access points in those communities for potential clients to use our services. And then um, we could link them up with the library and their community so that they could have access to a computer and stable internet so that they could participate in our trainings. So expanding support um, is very is vital for addressing the Alice workers in Connecticut. For many families, the lack of access translates directly to reduced job opportunities, educational opportunities, and reduced healthcare access, as well as um, financial tools. So as you can see, 32% of adults with income below $30,000 applied for a job on their phone compared to only 7% of smartphone users with income above $75,000. So smartphone technology we know is consistently improving, but many of the tasks are still difficult to, to complete on a small screen of a smartphone device, such as word processing, filling out applications, editing spreadsheets, and other tasks similar to that. And many websites also don't um, provide a mobile version, which makes navigation on a smartphone time consuming and difficult to process. So the high usage of smartphones to complete critical tasks indicates that low income households have limited access to internet at home. Um, in Connecticut, 29% of households with income below the Alice threshold do not have an internet subscription compared with only 6% of households above the Alice threshold um, having internet access. So internet access is typically lower in the rural parts of the state. A secure and reliable internet network that provides access to our trainings and services can facilitate the support services we have for our clients. CRI can expand support to our clients by offering access to secure and reliable internet, like Natalia mentioned, such as through internet and also through internet enabled devices or we can direct clients to internet access points such as libraries or other CRI locations. So having CRI services be mobile friendly is important since that is the primary device being used by our clients. CRI programs should frequently use um, multiple platforms to connect with clients. This includes call, text, um, email, our website, as well as social media. So CRI training should include a focus on developing technology, technology skills due to the rise in automation that we discussed earlier. All jobs are increasingly requiring the ability to work with technology. Many jobs across all industries will require the increasing ability to incorporate new technologies. Alice workers will need to gain new skills rapidly, and that will, will require more on-the-job training, more flexibility um, to change career paths and different kinds of education providers. So training should include entering and manipulating data, making database decisions, research, and adjusting to new technologies in the workplace. Having this training and technological knowledge will only help a candidate looking for a job to broaden the scope of the positions they are applying for. Additionally, CRI can offer Microsoft Excel basic training and um, continuing to expand our other technological trainings and certificate practices. So as Connecticut's wealth gap increases, there's also an opportunity for CRI to provide financial management strategies during training and throughout every client interaction with CRI. So now we'll open it up for a Q&A. So you feel free to unmute your mic to ask a question or you can drop your question in the chat. Hey, Natalia and Andre, just want to first say um, thank you for putting this presentation together. This was really uh, insightful and helpful. Um, and I think that you guys shared a number of uh, uh, interesting data points. You know, I, I was struck by the last slide uh, in terms of expanding services. 
And I was wondering if you guys can just shed some light on some of the steps uh, CRI has started to take to expand services, particularly around da data entry, making data-driven decisions, adjusting to, to, to new technologies and financial literacy. Uh, and I'm asking this question because I think it would be helpful for all of us on a call to kind of get some context as to the progress we're making. And perhaps as others uh, ask questions and, and contribute uh, to this conversation, they can share some of the things they're noticing that CRI is introducing in other departments. Yeah, I think that one thing that um, I instantly thought of when you, you brought that up was um, our virtual assistant, which I know Andre has worked um, a lot with Marcus on. So I'll let her uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so we are trying to equip uh, clients with information, with knowledge to navigate this virtual workspace. Um, being coming a virtual assistant requires um, the ability to use technology in a way that is professional and also effective for different organizations. So um, we will provide training on how to um, manage Zoom, a Zoom platform or virtual platforms like Zoom and connect people with different meetings, scheduling, as well as data entry and um, manipulating different forms of technology. Yeah, I think it's a really um, great program that we're we're setting up. I haven't worked that much um, on it with Andre and Marcus, but I, I've sat in through meetings and um, they have a really good vision for with Keisha, who is our Zoom administrator and assistant director. Who, um, they have a, a great vision for how to make this happen. Keisha has been helping a lot with um, how to create um, an SOP on how to be a Zoom administrator. And I think that that will... Um, that will really help in training programs, even um, just incorporate, incorporating it as um, a regular training in the future once we have something um, really narrowed down. Any other questions, guys? Can you, um, I'm not seeing any hands here, so I'll ask another question. Can you talk about what, what technologies um, has CRI started to introduce into our workflow and how are those technologies impacting the learning experience of our customers, uh, particularly since uh, COVID hit uh, our country. Yeah, definitely. So we um, start using a platform called Grasshopper, which allows you to um, send messages and calls right from your device, but without sharing out your personal number. It professionalizes your communication with different clients and other um, partners. So all um, staff are able to use that to communicate. And then we also have been using Calendly to schedule events and to schedule orientations, interviews. Um, and it allows us to um, streamline the process of scheduling, um, especially when you have multiple people coming into um, one platform. Yeah, and as you guys know, um, we've been using Zoom for a few months. Um, I'm almost certain that right now there's a training going on in another breakout room. So those are, I think, our three um, main technologies that we've uh, used and have and recently implemented. Hold on, we have a question in the chat here. Um, when will the trainings initially for staff be available and will it give us tools to share with customers? Hey, Diane, can you specify what type of training you're talking about? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the Zoom trainings, how as, um, uh, as, um, career advisors or job developers that we can use specifically, let's start with Zoom because that's what we've been using so far. And to be a very effective when we reach out to our customers and to be effective enough to have them um, 
be engaged and continue to be engaged, whatever tools that you have. And then also part of the engagement is to give them some power to be able to use some of those tools also when they, you know, in their job search or when they come back to with us when we have our, you know, periodic meetings with them, things like that. You want me to do that? You guys want to take that? <laughs> you can take it. <laughs> <laughs> um so so Diane I think that first of all thank you for that question I think is a really good question you you are going to experience um some of the zoom stuff when we do the job uh, fair in a couple of weeks with BSU and um I think that's a really really good starting place outside of that <laughs> we are working on it that's the short answer. And we're working on it with uh, uh, Danielle Turner, uh, the VP down in uh, Bridgeport, as well as Kathy Manis, v our VP in Waterbury. And what we're looking at is how can we leverage Zoom to handle all client transactions or in-person transactions in conjunction with Calendly. And the intention there is to organize time so that clients are scheduled uh, at a specific time to meet with a very specific staff person. Um, and, and what we intend to do, instead of uh, conducting a full-fledged training on Zoom, which has been designed by uh, Chuck Venter, who now I think does our financial centers. He, he works with uh, Angela Pellegrino Grant. Chuck designed a PowerPoint um, and if you would like to have that PowerPoint, anyone would like to have that PowerPoint, if you can just kindly leave your email address in the chat, uh, Natalia and Andre will share that with you. But beyond that, uh, what we're piloting with uh, Danielle and Kathy is the idea of utilizing the current Zoom room you guys are in and leveraging our Zoom administrator to facilitate and to coordinate client um, clients coming into the system. So we found that it'd be, it could be more efficient that way. And what, what we intend to happen is very similar to what happened to everyone on this call. You're greeted by a live staff person whose full-time job is to do just that. You will be uh, ushered into another room uh, as a waiting room until your session is ready. And then a staff person will then move you into a private room to conduct your business. This, we believe, will cut down on some of the, the learning curve as it relates to Zoom, and it will allow you all to focus on the main thing, which is serving our customers, providing quality service, getting people jobs, right? And we're working to just alleviate all the pressure points outside of that. So that's kind of the quick response I have as it relates to that. And accordingly, uh, as we finalize the development of such uh, processes, we intend to provide Danielle and, and Kathy with a one-page link to all the necessary places they need to be. And all staff have to do is just click and poof, you're there, right? So, so that, that's the plan. Does that help? Oh, okay, two thumbs up. Thank you. I appreciate the two thumbs. If you have a third, I would ask for it. <laughs> Angela, you want to chime in here on that? I, I see you there. I don't know if you had any, any contributions there on, on that last uh, question there. No. <laughs> you covered it all, honestly. Like I, I, yeah, I, I don't have any I don't have anything to I could just say the same thing again, but I don't have anything <laughs> new to add. Other questions for folks on the line about the Alice report? And uh, um, I also want to say, uh, Natalia and Andrea, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very well presented and uh, was very clear and concise. Um, the information was very easy to digest because I know there's a lot there because I've been through the Alice report myself uh, pre like about a year or so ago and it was overwhelming. So thank you. That really helped a lot. You know, You're welcome. Thank you. And we'll be sure to send the PowerPoint to all the attendees today. So yeah. um, we'll send and the actual report as well, if you guys um, would like to dive in further.
Um, any other questions? Yeah. If I could ask this one question uh, to the group, based upon the information Natalia and Andre uh, shared with us today, what's one takeaway you intend to bring back to your team and your supervisor that could help inform services program delivery uh, within your department? Feel free to unmute your line or to put in the chat. What takeaway, what strategy, what piece of information do you intend to bring back to your team and to your supervisor that could inform services and program delivery? So I just want to say as someone who, you know, deals with stuff on, on kind of a high level strategy um, perspective that um, I find information about the Alice population to be essential to everything we do. Um, and, and so I, I personally try to keep it kind of at the forefront of my mind all the time when I'm thinking about our services and, and how they affect our population. Um, where one of the things that, that I think we know at CRI is that if we're not careful, we create Alice workers. And so we, we have to, we sort of have to always be mindful um, that we're, we're moving people not only out of sort of the official definition of poverty, but into an actual sustainable financial situation. That's good. That's real good. I appreciate that, Angel. Thank you John so much. Said, um, encourage everyone to continue with their studies. Education is key. Um, Kate said the idea that new technologies can be extremely helpful. Also, we need radical upskilling for clients and colleagues. Mm. Yeah. I, I would I just would, would like to toss out. Um, thank you both Andre and Nathalia for, um, for the report and, and your insights and recommendations. I just want to toss out for just food for thought for people is, is to think about market conditions. Um, I've been in the workforce more than four decades and um, the, the market conditions, uh, my observation is that market conditions in terms of job opportunity um, and workers' rights um, has declined steadily over that entire time. Uh, it started when I graduated high school is when we started losing all the steel mills and there were all the, the bankruptcies in, in Pennsylvania. And, uh, and so we're in our industry in CRI, we're fighting very hard to get people out into the economy. Um, but um, sometimes it, it, it um, how are we going to, we're, we're basically combating market forces on some of this. So just, just to think about um, what's going on there. Thank you for that. Um, Diane said to approach the customer as their place in the Alice status with respect, empathy and availability to many resources. Anyone else want to yeah, share a takeaway or a question? Awesome. Well, we appreciate everyone's time. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to be a part of this session. Um, for all those of you that would like to receive a PowerPoint, um, we will send that out to you all. If there's no other questions for the good of the group, you all have an awesome day. Stay dry, stay safe, wash your hands. Uh, don't kiss any babies so you don't get any cooties, all that good stuff. Thank you all. All right, everybody, be well. Thank you guys. Thank you.